Joseph's story reveals prophecy. It foretells us the hidden things that are, that are coming in the future because the Bible reveals the Bible. The Bible explains the Bible. Scripture is the best commentary for Scripture, right? And we look at the story of Joseph or Yosef, if you're in Israel, and we see that he had, he was rejected by his own, and he later he was falsely accused, and he was put down in that place of the condemned and raised up out of it, right? And he was the only one found worthy to reveal the future plan of God. And there was a time of a seven year time of great trouble, a famine over the whole face of the earth. And that's when he saves who? Israel, his brethren, his beloved brethren, whom he always loved and he forgave. That's who he saves, you guys. And so what we see in his story, then he had a Gentile bride, right? During all that famine, he had a Gentile bride who was with him in his palace. Do you see the story, you guys? It's the same story as today. It, God revealed this to us. You can see it in Joseph's story because he is a type and a picture of Jesus. And we get his plan from this. This is so good. I'm excited because you're going to be so blessed in this episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below, you guys, because you're going to get all this kind of content. We're doing a playlist. There's a playlist you can click on. We're doing a series right now. Jesus in the Old Testament. So good, guys. So let's get into this right now, my friend. No further ado. We're in Genesis or the first book of the Bible, Breshit, if you're in Israel, the book of beginnings written by Moses. Here we go. This is going to be great. I love this. So Joseph or Yosef and Jesus, or you could say Yeshua if you're in Israel. Usually the J is a Y, like Jerusalem would be Yerushalayim. Um, you know, Joseph would be Yosef. Jacob would be Yaakov. The J is typically a Y in the Hebrew. So <laughs> it's just a little side note there, something that's interesting. So let's get into Joseph's story. Well, let's first go into when Jesus was walking on that road to Emmaus and he explained to these two disciples, Jesus was in disguise. He didn't let them know who he was. And he explained to them on resurrection day who he was. This is amazing. He wrote, he said, all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And this was later in the evening when he was with all of the disciples, after he was with those two. So he's, he puts it in that order. Interesting, right? The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Well, what's interesting about that is that is the order the Jewish Bible in, is in today, the Tanakh. All right, so let's look at this, guys. This is the big timeline. We have creation. And we're going to go all the way to Micah. So this is like the Old Testament, basically. So BC, what does that mean? Yes, before Christ. And then here we have all of this, the Adam and Eve creation, Adam and Eve, the flood, Abraham and Isaac. And then we have, you know, Jacob. And, and, and then we have Yosef or Joseph, my favorite story. And this is all written by Moses. And Moses is right around 1400 BC. Um, maybe 1600 BC. We're not quite sure on that. And then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, these guys were around between 2400 to 2000 BC. All right. So that's where we are on the timeline. So the books of the Old Testament or the books of the Tanakh, if you're in Israel, the TA means Torah, first five books written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Navim, that's the end and the part of the Tanakh, is the prophets. So it's all the prophets listed there. And the Ketuvim is the writings, which is like the Psalms, Proverbs, and other books. So that's how we get that. So now let's look at that. So remember Jesus, let's go back real quick. Jesus put it in that order. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Because Jesus was very Jewish. A lot of my Jewish friends, I, I love my, my Jewish friends. We have lots of debates in the comment section of these videos a lot of times and, and in other places. And, and I just love debating with them about where Jesus is and about the Old Testament versus New Testament. And most of the time, it's just really, we, we just love each other. We're friends. We become friends. We keep it that way. And I love, it's okay to disagree. And if you disagree, comment below on your disagreement. It's fine. 
this is this is a place where you could feel safe to disagree you guys unlike most of the world today especially in america and american politics right so let's get it back into this so the books of the tanakh there they are listed and then the torah was the first of the part of the tanakh which is the first five books the law of moses they call it written by moses remember jesus said Things about me and where? The law of Moses, he said. So we're going to be in Genesis or Breshit. It's the very book of beginnings, the very beginning. And here it is in Hebrew, as you can see it there. And, and that's how you would say it, Breshit. And that means in the beginning, all right? And we're going to see that one-fourth, you guys, one-fourth or 25% of the book of Genesis is devoted to one man. And who would this one man be? Yosef. Joseph, guys. Why would God dedicate one-fourth of this great book, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings to one man. I mean, this would be like getting your four-year degree in early history or in history and spending your entire senior year, that last of the four years to get your bachelor's degree, right, in college, that last year on one man. Now, why would God do that as he's teaching us, <laughs> right? The greatest rabbi, God himself, the greatest professor he was, he was doing that to show you that his son, Yeshua, Yeshua, or Jesus, is pictured in this true, real-life story of Joseph. It was a prophetic, real life that was lived out and written about so that you could see the plan of God through Joseph's story, the plan that he had with Jesus, God the Son. So this is so exciting, you guys. Isn't this great to get into how we could see the Bible interprets the Bible for us? All right. So Genesis 37, we're going to review this real quick. Then they saw him, his brothers saw him from a distance. And before he came closer, remember they were at Dothan. Dothan means laws and customs. What were the Pharisees and religious leaders in? The laws and the customs. And before he came closer to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They stripped him of his tunic. Who else was stripped of his tunic? Yes, Jesus. They stripped him of his tunic and they cast lots for his clothing at the cross. John recorded that and it was a fulfillment of Psalm 22. And by the way, you might want to check out Psalm 22. I've done some videos on that and I guarantee you, you will be blessed by it because there's so much packed in there about Yeshua, about Jesus in that Psalm. In fact, the ancient rabbis considered that Psalm a messianic psalm. They they considered that about the future Messiah. And so it was later, it was like around 1080, 1000 years after Jesus, uh, that they decided that that was not a psalm about the Messiah. All right, so let's get back into it. So they stripped him of his tunic. He was sold for pieces of silver. Isn't that interesting? He was sold for 20 pieces of silver. And who came up with that plan? to sell him for pieces of silver. Yes, it was Judah. Well, we get the name Judas is where it was derived from the name Judah. So <laughs> there's so much to this. And by the way, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Well, Jesus was sold by Judah or Judas, excuse me, for 30 pieces of silver. Both of those were the price of a slave. So Jesus, he became uh, the, the servant of all. He became, he served us all. He became the, uh, like a slave when he was on that cross. He became, he suffered our sin. All sin was poured upon him and, and, and laid upon him. And he did that because he loves us. He willingly wanted to do that for us, you guys. Isn't that amazing? So he was sold for pieces of silver. And then later on, we're going to skip ahead now. In Genesis 41, 14, we see that, that Joseph was down in that pit with those two, remember? And it's just like the cross. There was two. There was one on each side of Jesus. And what happens with those two? One is cursed. The other is restored to life. 
restored to serve he who sat on the throne, just like the ones on the cross, you guys. So then later, then Pharaoh sent word. Remember, Pharaoh had this troubling dream about the future, and no one could reveal the dream, what it meant. No one in all the land, not any of his wise men, no one in all the earth and all the land could figure it out. Then Joseph sent word and called for, excuse me, Pharaoh sent word and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him up out of the dungeon. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. Remember that no one in all the land, it, it troubled the Pharaoh very much. It troubled to him and, and everyone around him. But let's look ahead in Revelation chapter 5, you guys, because you're going to see how the Bible reveals the Bible. In the very first book, reveals the very last book in a lot of ways. So, Revelation 5 says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. A lot of times they use these wax seals, you guys, and then they would compress them with like a signet ring or with a coin. Um, and this was to seal it so that only the person that it was going to be designated to go to can open it. So that's what we see. There's a throne of God. Here, John seeing this in, in Revelation chapter 5, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Wow, does that not remind you of Joseph's story, you guys? I mean, no one in all the land or under the earth in Revelation says no one anywhere was able to take the scrolls which were about the future, which was about to happen during this time of great trouble. No one can do it. No one in all the land, just like Joseph's story, there was no one who found who could interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. So this is an amazing thing that we're seeing, you guys. Then I began to weep. John began to weep. As he was in heaven in this vision, greatly he wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the, is from the tribe of Judah. So the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome so as to be able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And I saw a lamb, John says, standing as though he had been slain. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So Jesus was found worthy to take the scroll from the right hand of he who sat on on the throne. Isn't that beautiful, you guys? God reveals this to us. There's these gems hidden in these Old Testament books like Joseph and Moses' story and Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain, just like Jesus going up the mountain, carrying the wood on his back. He was like Isaac. And then Abraham was like the father carrying the torch, which is the picture of God's wrath. And then later Moses. Moses too was rejected by his own. And then later he had a Gentile bride. He was in a Gentile land shepherding the Gentile flock. And then God calls him back to save Israel while his Gentile bride was with him. So this is amazing. This is the Bible. So awesome. How God did this. God is so awesome. How he put this in there for us to discover. Isn't this awesome, you guys? All right. Now let's continue back into that presentation. And then the in Revelation, it says, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, and honor, glory, and blessing. Worthy is the lamb. Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua or Jesus, you guys. So good. And then Genesis 41 continues in Joseph's story. So Pharaoh said to Joseph or Yosef, since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. 
Pharaoh then clothed him in garments of fine linen, and he put the gold necklace around his neck. Now watch this, you guys. Watch this. Revelation chapter 1. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. Oh, my. So what did Pharaoh do? He who sat on the throne clothed him, Joseph, in garments of fine linen, and he put a gold necklace around his neck. And in Revelation, Jesus here in heaven, in the middle of the gold of the lampstands, right? The seven golden lampstands, the son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. Isn't that amazing, you guys? Hey, by the way, if you would like to order some of these books, I wrote book a book called Tolashani based on Psalm 22, especially in verse 6 or verse 7 if it's in your Hebrew Bible, but it's about the crimson worm of Psalm 22, and it reveals so much about that great psalm. And then I also wrote Joseph, a book about Joseph and how he is like Jesus, and then Road to Emmaus, that's that seven-mile journey when the resurrected Jesus walks along with those two and shows them where he's found in the Old Testament. And then the last book, The Same Today, that's a book about the testimony of my life and how God showed me great grace and love and mercy and saved me. So, <laughs> all right, you guys, so we'll get back to the presentation now. So, this is amazing, is it not? The picture that we see, the first book revealing the last book of the Bible. And then Joseph's story continues in Genesis 41, verse 43, and they pro proclaimed ahead of him, bow the knee. Then Pharaoh named Joseph Zaphnach Peneach. He gave him a new name, and that new name actually means Savior of one of the interpretations is Savior of the age. Isn't that amazing? But here's the interpretation the Bible gives God speaks and he lives. Now, Jesus is called what? The Word of God. God speaks and he lives. Jesus lives, you guys. He lives. He is alive today, my friend, sitting at the right hand of the power of God, waiting. He's preparing a place for us, you guys, just like in Jewish, old Jewish times, back in Jesus' time, the son would prepare a place for his bride. They would first be betrothed, and then he would prepare a place for her and him to have a seven-day honeymoon to Together, kind of like the seven-year uh, time of tribulation that we may be with Jesus in heaven in that place that he's preparing for us. And it, it, it was always attached to the Father's house. And the Son did not know the day or the hour. There would come a day when the Father would say, okay, go get your bride. He didn't know that day or hour, but that's the picture that the Bible gives us. Isn't that amazing, you guys? That is so awesome. I love this. All right, let's get back into it. So, God speaks. Pharaoh renames him Zaphnath Paneah. God speaks the word of God, the word, and he lives so much. There's so much pictures of Jesus in this, you guys, so many places in here. And he gave him Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar. Who was she? She was a Gentile. So the, he who sat on the throne gave him a Gentile bride, even though Joseph, Yosef was very Hebrew, very Jewish. And he still, he's getting a Gentile bride, just like Jesus for the most part as right now. I believe that's changing. I believe that re a great revival is coming to Israel and that they will have a homecoming with their true, their long lost brother whom they thought was dead and long gone out of their lives. And they're going to realize he's alive and he's going to forgive them. Just like Joseph's story. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of it. Let's, let's continue. So Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring for it was without number. He gathered up very much grain in that great time of abundance before that seven-year time of great trouble, right? That famine. In Revelation 7, it says this, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count or without number. Do you guys see the picture there? It's the same picture in Joseph's star, you guys. In fact, Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says, When that last number of Gentiles has come to Christ... Then all of Israel will be saved, just like Joseph's story. So when that last piece of grain was collected and put in the storehouses by Joseph, then he shut the storehouses, it was closed, 
And then there was that seven-year time of great trouble. And that is when he saves all of Israel. At one moment, they're going to be saved. Amazing, you guys. The Bible explains the Bible, does it not? All right, so let's continue. And then he, and that continues in Revelation, that great multitude, which no one can number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. So let's go back to Genesis, Joseph's story, right? Genesis 41, verse 56, the famine, the seven-year time of great trouble. It could even be called Jacob's trouble or Yaakov's trouble. The famine was spread all over, over the, the entire face of the earth. The entire face of the earth? This is a worldwide problem here, the Bible tells us. Oh my. And then Genesis 44, 14 says, Then, and when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell down to the ground before him. So they're prostrate before him. It says in the Bible that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is is lord everyone's gonna bow the knee someday you guys and be face down before jesus it's better to be to do that now and be saved than to do it and have to go to eternal condemnation you wouldn't want that nobody wants that in fact god didn't want that that's why jesus came on a great rescue mission to save you my friend he came to save you he loves you god loves you that's why jesus died on the cross and it's so important that we understand that you guys very very important stuff okay let's get back into that so Jude and his brothers come back. They're, they're bowed down before this great leader. And we, you could see a picture of it here. It may have looked something like that, you guys, because he was a, a, the right hand man of he who sat on the throne of Pharaoh in charge of all of the land, just like Jesus has authority over everything, even now. And someday he'll take this earth back and rule and reign from it physically. It's going to be amazing when that day comes, you guys. All right. So Joseph said to his brothers, and I'm going to say it in Hebrew first, you guys, Ani Yosef. Imagine it, you guys, you're standing there. You thought your brother was long lost. You tried to murder him. You got rid of him, sold him as a slave years and years ago. You thought he was long lost, possibly even dead, out of your lives forever. But now you see he is alive and you're bowed down before him. You're scared of this this leader who could take your life. But then he says to you, Ani, Yosef, I am Joseph. Oh my and you must have, you would be free, you'd be so scared. Imagine it. That's how I would imagine those brothers, their jaws must have dropped. But then they, they were scared. And Joseph says, come closer. He said to them, he said, come closer, you guys, come closer. Don't be afraid. Is my father still alive? He said, come closer. I'm not going to hurt you. And he revealed who he was to them. And it says in the Bible that in Genesis, that he wept with each one of them individually. And if you go into Zechariah chapter 12, where it says they will look on him whom they pierced and they will weep for him. And it says in that chapter, it says that each of the 12 tribes individually will weep over that him whom they have pierced, whom they, Jesus, you guys. And this is the same story in Joseph. And what does Joseph tell them later? This is beautiful, you guys. Let's end with this. Joseph says to them, as for you, speaking to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive or to save many people, a remnant, you guys. And that was the plan of God the whole time, you guys, was to save people. And and Jesus, I can imagine, wouldn't you, someday Jesus might say this to the Jewish people, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. See, God is in the business of saving people, not condemning. He's in the business of saving. That is why he sent his only son, just like Joseph was sent out of Hebron, which means alliance or fellowship, or friendship. And the father sent him out to, to go get find his brothers to what? To save them. 
because he was concerned about him and he was willing to give his most favored son to save you and me. Isn't that amazing? His only son. And that's how Jacob looked at Joseph. It was as if he was his only son. And that's why his brothers were jealous and envious of him. But hey, my friend, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that right now, my friend. He's only a prayer away. He's waiting for you, my friend. He's been waiting for you. You may be feeling the the knock on the door of your heart right now. He may be saying, hey, let me in. You may be sensing that in your heart. That would be the Holy Spirit working on you, my friend. Don't reject him because you may never have another chance. The Bible says, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't harden your heart. This could be it. You want to give your life to him. And if you would like to do that, you can pray this prayer. I'll lead you in this prayer. And this is a prayer between you and God has nothing to do with me. I'm just helping you lead you there, right? But this is a prayer between you and God to be saved, to be born again. You're inviting Jesus to come into your life, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, and you will follow him the rest of the days of your life. It won't be perfect, but you will eventually end up in heaven because Jesus will be your Lord and Savior, and you'll be born again. You'll have a new life in him, you guys. Would you like that? Well, you can say this prayer right after me. You just repeat these words, you praying to God. Ready? Repeat after me. Dear God, I know that I am a sinner and I am sorry for my sin. I choose to turn from my sin and I ask that you would help me to do that. I believe that Jesus, you died on the cross. I believe you shed your blood for me. And I believe that in three days, you're raised from the dead and you are alive today. I choose to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, my friend, if you did that, God has saved you. You are a new child of God. You may be feeling something amazing right now. You may feel nothing. That doesn't matter. We go off of what scripture says. And welcome to the family of God, my friend. Make sure you're going to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. If you're in Israel, get connected with uh, Jews for Jesus or One for Israel. Those are great ministries. And you'll get fellowship. You need fellowship. And you also need to read your Bible the Old Testament and New Testament, both, right? And also, you need to pray every day, right? God bless you guys. I love you. Looking forward to the next episode. Don't forget, you you guys, don't forget, you want to hit that playlist up here because you get the the playlist. Well, uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, you're going to see all the places. We're starting a new series in that, and you're going to see all the places where he's found in the Old Testament or in the Tanakh if you're in Israel. All right, you guys, God bless you. I love you.